I don't remember. I don't remember. I can't tell you how many days were in this week. I don't think there were seven, though. We were just talking about that uh, in the back just a minute ago. I was like, wait a minute, that was Monday. That was yesterday, right? No. It's been like a whole week ago. It was difficult, right? You had things that challenged you, things that you faced. Somehow you're still here. So it didn't overcome you. There was emotions, feelings, things that you went through this week that you didn't go through the week before. Things that you faced that were new. Some things, they've been dragging out for a few weeks, right? Whatever it was, I hope and I pray that you made time for God. I don't know when you're going to get sick of me saying this, but <laughs> that's an important part of us staying alive in the Spirit. It's how our souls find strength in times of testing. It's where our, our, our very being stands in the face of darkness and says, no, nope, I know where the light comes from. I hope you had time to be in the Scriptures this week. I hope you had time to pray this week, no matter how it was. And I pray that you had the chance to be the hands and feet of Christ to someone else this week, because that's where you find him. That's where he's visible to you. When you start talking about that purpose and the doing, that's where we find him being tangible. Remember, do not be afraid. Whatever you need, there is enough of it. And even if you don't think you can do it, you are enough. I can count on at least one hand this week alone how many people I talked to that realized, and maybe we didn't use these words when we said it, but how many people realized that they were enough. I didn't think I could insert this, and yet there I was. I've heard that a lot this week. It's been empowering. And I pray that you are finding yourself there. Last week we began this new series in, in, in power and purpose. How can we find strength in this purpose? And, and last week I talked to you a little bit about Abraham, right? Talked a little bit about Jesus. We talked about other you know, characters from Scripture. Uh, we, we heard that we are temporary residents here, right? We are tenants of, of God's life that he's given us. I talked about how from the time you are born to the time you die, everything in between is God's. If it's given to you, and what you're doing with it is your gift to him. Because you didn't come into this world with anything, and you won't leave with anything. It's up to you what happens between. Today's text, I wanted to take us back to the Old Testament. Because if we really look at Scripture as a whole, there is a purpose in what God is doing from the beginning of, of Scripture all the way through to the end. I told you last week we can kind of break this down into three categories, and this is that first category, God's purpose in the Old Testament. What was that purpose? We find him talking to Abraham, right? Abraham is struggling. He's in a moment here where he's face to face with God. God says to him, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. If you get nothing out of today's message, you are part of that blessing from the family of Abraham. That's your family. That's your true heritage. Now, we all have different heritage, though, right? Some of us are like, well, you know, I'm 
kind of part German, maybe part Scottish, maybe part this, maybe part that. It's what we are as Americans, right? We, we, we are from somebody somewhere else, and we come here, and, and we still contain some of those pieces and parts of our heritage. Now, when we come to understanding Christ, when we come to know Christ, we are now into this new family. We now can go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years and say that we are part of Abraham's family. When you look back at what God is saying to Abraham here, see, he, he tempted Abraham, did he not? He said, prove it. You love me with everything you've got, then prove it. Take your son Isaac, this prized child that you asked for, take him up the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Abraham, as much as we want to think that he didn't hesitate, I want to think that he hesitated, right? He's like, uh, okay. We have this vision that Abraham was very strong, and he was very like, come on, Isaac, let's go. <laughs> God wants us to do this. But I have to believe that somewhere in Abraham was the turmoil. The turmoil of, man, I know God. He speaks to me. We have a relationship. But what he is asking me to do will absolutely destroy me, right here. And God let him. God stayed with him. God walked with him as he went. The closer he got, the closer he got, the closer he got. He's willing to sacrifice his son. He's willing to do this. And I can imagine God going, wow. I've never seen such faith before. I've never seen someone who wants to give up everything. A person who wants to actually destroy themselves just in order to be with me. And so the goat appears, right? The sacrifice that should have been appears. And so Abraham has this story to share with Isaac. And I'm, and I'm wondering if he ever told him that he was, you know, it's like I was just kidding. I knew there was a, a goat up there the whole time, right? <laughs> or did he share that story with Isaac, his pal? Like, I struggled, son, but I knew that if God needed me to, he needed you more than I did. And that I was going to be okay. And then God shows up. Where are we as believers? Do we come to church expecting God to just provide everything on our wish list? Do we then get upset when not everything on our wish list is meant? <coughs> I didn't like that song. I'm not coming back. I wanted a new job. I'm still stuck in this one. I'm not coming back. This God is a hoax. <laughs> Ask Abraham. Do we get upset when God doesn't provide all the things that we've asked for? God does his best work in our lives when we are simply believing in him and being faithful. What does that mean? Our greatest focus should be in the same place of which Abraham placed his. As much as Abraham loved Isaac, as much as we love this world, he was ready to give it all up just in case God might be right. Have we done that? Abraham never once, <clears throat> he never once went up the mountain with the thought of, ah, you know what, God, I'll go ahead and sacrifice Isaac if you make me the leader of a great nation. Nope. That wasn't it. Uh, yeah, God, I'll tell you what, I will go up this mountain and I will sacrifice Isaac if 
uh, uh, you give me everything. You make me the father of all mankind. I'll be great. People will talk about me in Maplewood, Ohio in 2019. I don't think that's what he did. Abraham never wanted those things. Abraham found himself <coughs> in a place of humble obedience to a God that he had never seen and yet believed in. He simply wanted to live a life that was reflective of God. He wanted nothing more than to please him, and he wanted nothing more than to make God proud of who he was. He didn't want anything. <coughs> The God of Old Testament scripture is not missing today. And I know that there's people out there that think, well, Jesus came and made a new covenant with us, so we don't need to read the Old Testament. Wrong. This is part of the story. This is part of the reason that Jesus ever even came. Because mankind, after Abraham, would prove over and over and over again that they weren't worthy of worshiping God. They got caught up in the world, right? Look at King David. Great David. A man after God's own heart, right? Murderer, adulterer, liar, thief. And he wasn't a very good guy. But yet he struggled with that. He struggled with that, the, the things and the choices and the decisions that he made. And yet he still believed that God was there with him. The same God who used Moses to bring the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt is the same God who called Abraham. He's the same God who stopped a young David and said, why not go take sandwiches to your brothers? Oh, while you're there, go ahead and stop this giant. We forget that part, right? We forget that he wasn't there to, to, to stop Goliath. He wasn't there to to get the glory, he was there to bring them lunch. He is the same God that wanted to prove a once for all forgiveness of sin to us, and he sent his son to do it. That's the same God. That same God is with us here. He is here today. He is calling you to be a part of the family of Abraham. Paul formerly known as Saul, was, and, and he tells us in Scripture that he was the greatest of sinners. He was the worst, the chief of all sinners, I believe, is what he says. And Paul is speaking to the church of Galatia here. In Galatians 3, 7 through 9, he's basically telling them the same thing. He says, the real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. Notice he doesn't say those who get all that they ask for from God. He said those who put their faith in God. What's more, <clears throat> the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. God's purpose has always been to find people that are in the family. He has always and still is in the redemption business. He is still leaving the 99 to go find the one. Jesus, Son of God, right? He could have saved the earth in a different way, couldn't he? He could have just came down in this miraculous beam of light, swooped everybody up that was worth it, and left everybody that wasn't. Instead, he's birthed as a man to a virgin who happens to be engaged with carpenter. Born in a stable, cave, depending upon how you want to 
geologically put yourself in the setting of the time. It's raised. It's a person. Learn how to build. Learn how to live life. Learn how to do things. And it was in his baptism then that his ministry began. If that's not us, I don't know what is. It's normal. It's pretty boring. This great God of all power and strength just became a baby. Raised by this misfit husband and wife that, you know, she, he kind of came before he was supposed to, before they were even married. I mean, that's all work. Sounds pretty pretty similar. I mean, we could probably make a good hit TV show out of that about right now, couldn't we? God's purpose, just like Jesus, is to find people who are unworthy. Moses was a stutterer. He wasn't an eloquent speaker. He didn't even know who his family was. He was picked up out of the out of the river and you know adopted. And yet he was the one that God chose to speak to in that burning bush. He was the one that was given the, 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 the task of gathering up the people, the, the Israelites, God's people, and getting them out of slavery in Egypt. Where are we placing our faith? Do we want material things? Oh, I want the house. I want a better job. I need a new car. Maybe it's, maybe it's these earthly relationships that we have. Oh, they're so important. Oh, I don't know what I would do. So-and-so wasn't here. It's good to have that kind of depth in your relationship, but it's also damaging. Maybe wealth. I just want all the money so I can do all the things. I, I, I help people, though, too. Where is that faith? Can we find it in ourselves to look deeper? To dig a little bit harder? To, to kind of, as Shrek would say, peel back the layers of our onion? So that we can find what it is that truly, truly makes us content. What is it that truly helps us to find our place in our faith where we don't really care about the worldly things, we don't really care about what so-and-so said, we don't really care about whether or not we got a job this week or not. We are so content with our life and our faith that God is going to take care of us. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to live and I'm going to share this message with as many people as I can. Literally, literally. I read this from, from, from Dr. Tony Evans this week. Now, now, how many of us know Jeremiah 29 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. Oh, man, that's a good one. It's on a mug in my house, right? Oh, he's got plans for me. Come on, show me what the plan is. Look at but we, we stop right there, right? We stop right there with that verse. We go, 2911, I love this. And we feel like a contestant on the price is right. Johnny, tell him what he's won. It's Jeremiah 2911. Woo, you're going to give me hope. You're going to give me a future. I'm going to spin this wheel. Go further. Go further. See, Jeremiah... The prophet is addressing a group of exiled Israelites who were tempted to lose hope. They were defeated by the Babylonians. They were sent out into exile from their homeland because of their sin. But what do what were they doing now? What were they up to? How should they live? They're, they're exiled. They're not even at home anymore. They're in a foreign land. How should they live? The Israelites had forgotten that even though they were exiled from the land that they were supposed to have, they were not exiled from their God. They were God's chosen people, and he still beckoned them in the midst of their difficult circumstances to seek after him with all they have. Go on to verse 13. Keep reading into Jeremiah. Jeremiah 13 to 14. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you. Are you looking today, church? Are you even looking at him at all? I think he's looking. <laughs> we hear voices of the world and we think that they are somehow still louder than God because they hold a precedence over us. They are not. The sky is not falling. You still have value. Those bills will get paid somehow. That disease can only do what it can do to you because there's a life waiting for us that isn't here because we're not home yet, right? Just like the Israelites, God has not left you in exile. You matter to God and hopefully he matters to you. Sometimes knowing that God desires a deeper relationship with us can lead us into a deeper relationship into understanding our lives. He has not left you in exile in Babylon. He has not put you on a shelf. He has not pushed you away. He is asking you very intently, do you believe in me? In the midst of everything that you're facing, do you still believe? Abraham had the knife. He was ready. Do you have the knife? Are you ready to make the ultimate sacrifice because you believe in him so much? How is God calling you into this relationship with him deeper and deeper so that you can find out more about yourself and where he wants you to be? How can God take our scars? How can he take everything that we've been through, the story that has been written of our life, and continue to shine like the sun to a world that totally, really, completely needs to hear about it? Are you where he wants you to be? Amen. Amen.